born David Robert Jones on January 8, 1947 in London, David adopted the stage name Bowie in the late 1960s. With a career spanning over five decades, he experimented with various music styles and personas including glam rock, art rock, soul, funk, and even electronic music. Today we are looking at his song, Andy Warhol, and what the icon himself thought of the song Bowie wrote about him. First, let's look at the legacy of Bowie. Chapter 1, Bowie's Legacy. Some of Bowie's most famous albums include The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars from 1972, Heroes from 1977, and Let's Dance from 1983. But truly, the breadth and diversity of his work means that everyone has a favorite album, and they differ greatly from person to person. He is known for his innovative approach to music, his distinctive voice, and his ever-changing visual style, often characterized by elaborate costumes, makeup, and alter egos. But we passed away on January 10, 2016, at the age of 69, after battling liver cancer. He left behind a rich legacy of music, art, and cultural influence that continues to resonate with audiences worldwide. He is truly an icon of music and culture. But early in his career, he was inspired by another cultural icon, Andy Warhol and his New York scene. Chapter 2, The Lead Up to Hunky Dory. After releasing The Man Who Sold the World in mid-1970, Bowie briefly stepped away from touring and recording. Contractually, his deal with publisher Essex had expired, and there were challenges with his new manager, Tony DeFries, who, after signing with Bowie, took on a number of other artists, thus limiting his time with Bowie. The album was also a bit of a flop in the UK, failing to gain traction that Bowie had hoped. But by late 1970 and early 1971, the album started picking up a little steam in the United States. Released stateside in November of 70, American radio stations started including it in the heavier rock formats, and his label Mercury sent him to tour in February of 71. It was on this trip that he was inspired to write tributes to three American icons, Bob Dylan, Velvet Underground, and Andy Warhol. These three tracks would ultimately be tucked comfortably and consecutively onto the B-side of Bowie's 1971 album, Hunky Dory. Wrapping it up was Queen Bitch, his tribute to the Velvet Underground. In the middle was Song for Bob Dylan, obviously about Bob Dylan. And kicking off the trifecta was Andy Warhol. Before digging deep into the song and Warhol's reaction to it, let's take a look at the icon and his legacy. Chapter 3, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol was an American artist, filmmaker, and leading figure in the pop art movement. Born Andrew Warhola on August 6, 1928 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he became renowned for his exploration of mass culture and consumerism through his art. Warhol's work often featured imagery from popular icons and culture, such as Campbell soup cans, Coca-Cola bottles, and celebrities like Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley. He used techniques such as silkscreen printing to mass-produce his artwork, blurring the lines between high art and commercialism. In addition to his visual art, Warhol was also a prolific filmmaker, creating experimental films such as Chelsea Girls in 1966 and Empire 1964, which famously consists of eight hours of footage of the Empire State Building. Warhol's studio, known as The Factory, became a hub of artists, musicians, writers, celebrities in New York City during the 1960s and 1970s, and he became a central figure in the city's avant-garde scene. Warhol passed away on February 22, 1987, but his influence on contemporary art and culture remains profound, with his works continuing to be celebrated and exhibited around the world. Let's look at... Oh, kitty. Let's look at his influence on music. Andy Warhol's influence through the factory extended far beyond the realm of visual art and into the world of music, fostering an environment of collaboration and innovation. Musicians who were associated with Warhol and the Factory include Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground, Nico, Bob Dylan, and, of course, David Bowie. 
Warhol famously managed and produced The Velvet Underground, a pioneering rock band formed in New York City in the mid-1960s. He introduced them to his artistic circle, provided financial support, and encouraged their avant-garde approach to music. The Velvet Underground's collaboration with Warhol resulted in the iconic album The Velvet Underground and Nico in 1967, featuring, again, iconic banana cover designed by Warhol himself. Warhol's distinctive visual style, characterized by bold colors, repetition, and graphic imagery, inspired many musicians and bands. His artwork adorned album covers, posters, promotional materials, becoming synonymous with music of the era. Bands and artists sought to align themselves with Warhol's aesthetic, leveraging his visual language to convey a sense of coolness and cultural relevance. Enter David Bowie and his song, Andy Warhol. Chapter 5, Andy Warhol by David Bowie. Bowie's Andy Warhol was featured in his 1971 album, Honky Dory. The song pays tribute to the iconic artist and reflects his fascination with Warhol's persona and artistic vision. Bowie's interest in Warhol had dated back to the mid-1960s, and he called the cultural icon a leader in the, quote, media of the streets, street messages. He was intrigued by the vibrant scene at the factory. Bowie was particularly captivated by Warhol's work with the Velvet Underground as the house band for his multimedia exhibits, such as the exploding plastic inevitable. The lyrics of Andy Warhol depict Bowie's admiration of Warhol's enigmatic personality and his impact on popular culture. The song blends Warhol's outlook on life with reality and art intertwining. Musically, like much of Hunky Dory, in comparison to the heavier hitting The Man Who Stole the World, Andy Warhol is stripped down in its arrangement, featuring primarily acoustic guitar and piano. The song has a gentle, almost whimsical melody that contrasts with the edgier subject matter. It makes reference to several aspects of Warhol's art and lifestyle, including his factory studio, his silkscreen prints, and even his infamous 15 minutes of fame concept. Bowie captures the essence of Warhol's avant-garde sensibilities and his role as a cultural icon in a creative and minimalist sense. The throaty chorus, in particular Bowie's vocalization of the lyrics, hang him on my wall, almost has an early Mark Bolan-esque quality to them, and the music itself nods to a blend of psychedelic folk of Tyrannosaurus Rex juxtaposed with the transitionary glam of the first T-Rex albums as well. Warhol was known to appreciate and engage with popular culture, often seeing his own celebrity as a form of art. Given the nature of Bowie's song, which portrays Warhol in a somewhat enigmatic and complex light, it's possible Warhol might have found it intriguing or even flattering. But he didn't. I'm just taking a quick moment to say, hey, if you like album stories like this, why don't you become a member? It only costs two bucks a month, and it helps support me and my channel. This channel really doesn't make much money at all. It's more a labor of love, a labor of passion. Chapter 6. Andy Warhol Hated the Bowie Song About Him By 1971, Bowie had befriended the actor Tony DeZanetta. Tony portrayed Warhol in the artist's play Pork, which Bowie caught in London. The two hit it off, and the friendship led Zanetta to offer to show Bowie around New York when he happened across the pond. It was through Zanetta that Bowie finally met Warhol at his iconic venue, The Factory, in September of 71. Describing the encounter, Zanetta would recall the tension. The meeting was kind of tense because Warhol was not a great talker. He had to talk and entertain Andy, and David wasn't really a great talker either. Nobody was really taking this conversation and running with it. Bowie would later recount the visit as well, characterizing the scene at the factory as bustling with activity while Warhol remained largely silent. A normal thing for Andy. He would just sit back and observe. He had wanted to impress the man who fascinated him so tremendously performing his song for Andy at the factory. But despite Bowie's attempt to pay his idol homage with a tribute song about him, the artist's reaction was underwhelming to say the least. Andy, quote, was in the factory place, and it was a hive of activity. Everyone was doing something, talking up this, talking up that, Bowie would say in an interview in 1987. The guy was just sort of very quiet, sort of like a, 
a lethal kind of Svengali figure over the whole thing. Everything happened without his seeming to be taking part in any of it. He was an extraordinary, hypnotic kind of guy. Boy would continue. I took the song to the factory when I first came to America, and I played it to him, and he hated it, he loathed it. He went, oh, uh-huh, and then just walked away. I was left there. According to Far Out Magazine, quote, Bowie's star power was lost on Warhol, who thought he was just another obsessive fan who had wrangled his way into the factory. Zanetta's recollection of the initial meeting follows suit. Warhol didn't say anything, but he absolutely hated it, he recalled, which didn't help the meeting. Remember, David Bowie was not a big star. He was just some guy off the street, as far as Andy Warhol was concerned. In 1997, Bowie talked about his fascination with the encounter, noting that Andy had, quote, nothing to say at all, absolutely nothing. Quote, soon after, Bowie said somebody came over to him and said, gee, Andy hated it. Bowie added, I said, sorry, it was meant to be a compliment. They then told Bowie that Warhol didn't like references to his appearance since he was sensitive about his skin condition. You might think the story ends there and that the two iconic figures would forever go their own way. But no, there was one thing that brought them together that night. Shoes. Bowie's choice of footwear that evening was an eccentric pair of yellow Mary Jane shoes, and it was these that unexpectedly broke the ice. It was my shoes that got him, Bowie would remark. That's where we found something to talk about. There were these little yellow things with a strap across them like girls' shoes. He absolutely adored them. Andy had been a shoe illustrator, Zanetta would say, which David knew, so they began talking about shoes. Reflecting on Warhol's persona, Bowie noted his insecurities and suggested that he was often misunderstood as malicious. When Bowie portrayed Warhol in Basquiat in 1996, he aimed to capture the artist's vulnerability, describing him as having, quote, almost a little boy lost quality beneath his iconic image. A year after their encounter, Bowie would release Ziggy Stardust, and his trajectory from slight anonymity to cultural icon would truly begin its exponential ascent. Had he met Warhol then, who knows what might have transpired. Perhaps Warhol would have been flattered, or maybe his reaction would have been the same. We will never know. If you like stories like this, you might like some of my other album story videos. You can check some of those out right here. As people have said many times over, this dude is a damn nerd. I'm Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel. That little guy was Waffles, and I'll see you in the next video.